Okay, so what I want to do is to uh, take you to the Pyramid of Unas at Saqqara to look at a specific part of the pyramid text. And to get oriented, I'm going to take you to a virtual version of the, this is courtesy of the Egypt Exploration Society. So let's go into virtual Unas and get oriented. So I'm going to walk back to the entry corridor and then turn around. So we're coming into the Pyramid of Unas and um, we are, I'm gonna get the frame a little bit oriented, re -or redirected, okay. We're coming into the antechamber and, uh, and the particular part of the pyramid text that I'm interested in is right here on this wall. So this is the Eastern wall of the antechamber. Here's the corridor that goes to the Serdab, which is a, which are three alcoves that are not inscribed. Here on the left is the north wall, the south wall is on that side. And the text that I'm going to uh, analyze right now begins, um, begins just about up here. So this is pyramid text 300 and 301, and that fills this whole entire section all the way down to this corner here. Just to uh, cover the rest of the chamber system, that's the ceiling, that's the south wall, that's the west wall. This is the corridor to the sarcophagus chamber. We're not gonna go in there today. Um, and, uh, and then this is the entry where we came in from. So I'm gonna close the virtual pyramid and then uh, first of all, get you oriented in terms of the, the map. So this is uh, a map of the Northern part of Egypt, this is called the Delta. This is the north direction. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. There's the Sinai Peninsula in the east. Here's Giza. And uh, there's the there's Saqqara with the Pyramid of Unas. There's uh, Joser Step Pyramid. So this is all within less than 20 kilometers. Here's Dashur, Red Pyramid, Ben Pyramid. And uh, the cardinal directions are due east in that direction. So this is the direction that the Unas pyramid is oriented to. The east wall is in fact pointing due east, just like the Great Sphinx at Giza is pointing to east. So is the pyramid. Um, and uh, and um, this is gonna come up in a few moments, but uh, I'm, I'm focusing on the Northern aspect of the east wall. So that would be the Northeast. And that part of Egypt, uh, this, the Delta here in the east uh, was called there was a location called Shat, which is probably a town, a village that had some kind of significance. And uh, the, um, the, the desert region past the Delta was probably called the Shezemet. So the Shat and the Shezemet are parts of the Delta in the East. And um, there's also the Western Delta over here. That is, that's what we would call Libya nowadays, but um, in the ancient Egyptian language, this was called Thenu. So Thenu is in the West, that's the Western aspect past the Delta and uh, Shat and Chesimet are in the East. So this is gonna become important in a, in a few moments. And now uh, let's look at the sky. So in the 24th century BC, the sun arose into the constellation Leo uh, on the summer solstice. So that's why the sunrise is here due north of, I mean, north of due east. This happens to be about 62 degrees, 20 minutes of azimuth. And um, so this is the, the, the part of the sky that corresponds to the northeast. Um, and that, that is going to become important when we read the text on the northeastern aspect of this wall, because it will basically refer to this event, the sun rising into the constellation Leo uh, in the summer solstice. And then uh, finally, um, I wanna uh, just, uh, just to show you the big picture of the interior architecture of the Unas pyramid. So we're, came, we're coming in from here. This is the entry from the north. This is the antechamber. This is the Eastern wall. The particular passage I'm going to focus on is right here. This is the Serdab, just so you can see, this is a tripartite chamber system. There's nothing written in here. 
here's the corridor connecting to the sarcophagus chamber. And I put the Sphinx next to that because in my model, this entire segment here of the architecture is a recreation of the Great Sphinx, basically, meaning that these two alcoves are the four paws. And that means that uh, the, the mention of a cavern is relevant here because, of course, there is a potential that there is a void, a real void under the left four, four paw of the great of the great sphinx, or in front of it. And it turns out that that cavern is actually mentioned on these walls here. So, including the gable above this wall and the wall itself, and we're going to look at that in a few moments to see what is the significance of this cavern. Why is it so important? Okay, um, so that now takes us to one more place before I actually look at the wall. So this is the Giza Plateau. Now we're not in Saqqara, we're in Giza. These are the Giza pyramids. Here's the Great Sphinx. There is the Sphinx Temple, the Valley Temple. And I want you to look at this here in the front. So these are two docks. This used to be a boat dock, basically. So the Nile, when it flooded, it came all the way up to the temples. And these two boat docks, uh, they look like bridge yokes. So it's kind of an arched bridgeway that goes into the water. And this is going to become more, uh, important, but I just want you to be able to visualize this. So um, this is basically how you would approach the center, the central part of the Giza Plateau, which is the Sphinx greeting anybody who would come from the Nile and, uh, and approach the Giza Plateau. They would come at the Sphinx Temple via these two uh, bridge ports here. Okay, and now let's go to the eastern wall of the antechamber. So, as I mentioned, I'm going to focus on the, the pyramid text 300 and 301. 300 is a short pyramid text, so we're going to start with that. But I, before I start, just wanted to point out that there's a column number system that is also important here. So there's 36 columns on this particular wall, and this... Uh, this particular mention of Giza, which I'm going to mention in just a moment, is, is the 27th, is basically right here in the 29, 28, 27, 26 column. So it's 10 columns before the end is when we mention Giza. So it's in the northeast of, in the northeastern segment of this eastern wall of the antechamber. So let's go to the text. The pyramid texts usually begin with this formulaic mention of words to be spoken, Jet Medu. Jet Medu means words to be spoken. So um, it says, I share it and Nezat Mechenti. So it basically, it's addressing a person or an entity that's called Sheret of Nezat. It's not really clear who or what that is, but it apparently has to do with a ferryman because the ferry is mentioned. Mechenti, the ferryman uh, of Ayret Het, is another. It's another location or some, some, some characteristic of this ferryman, but it's unknown what this exactly means. But then here comes the, a descriptive term that we all understand. Ayret Chenemu means made by Hanum. So this ferryman is basically created by Hanum. And the mention of Hanum immediately brings up something that's very archaic about creation. It basically, Hanum is the ram god that was thought to dwell in the south of Egypt under the island of Elephantine in a cavern controlling the flow of the Nile and also being the creator of uh, human beings from the mud of the Nile, shaping the shape of the person and then, you know, uh, bringing them to life. And so this is immediately brings up the idea of creation, the idea of the river, the idea of water and uh, uh, an original well of water from a, a, a source of water uh, of, uh, uh, in, in, from a cavern. And so this is very important because it sets the tone of what's gonna come next. Um, so it mentions this ferryman made by, uh, by Hanum and then it says, bring ein, ein, Ainu and Unis means bring it for Unas. So Unas wants a ferry boat. And now where does he want to take this ferry boat? This is a crucial piece of evidence now that comes, it is because it is Unas who is uh, Zokar belonging to Rostau. Zokar Nai means belonging to Rostau. So now we know we're in Giza. So Unas is looking for a ferry to 
to go to Zokar, who is the hawk deity that guarded the underworld under under Giza, under Rostau. Uh, so now we know where we are. We are this is the Una's pyramid in Saqqara, but the text is taking us to Giza. The text is taking Una's to Giza. It's taking Una's to um, to a ferry. And this is why I was pointing out these docks because that's going to become important in the next text column. So we are getting the hint now that uh, Unas is visiting some kind of space, a cavern potentially, that is related to the Nile, is related to creation, is related to Kanum. And it is also where Zokar rules over, uh, rule, rules the underworld and that's in Giza, Rostau. So the text continues now here at the top and it says, um, uh, Ayu Unas, so Unas is near the place, Bu, uh, that belongs to Zokar, the foremost, Chent, Chenti Pejushai. So it means the, the foremost of the stretched lake. So now we're mentioned, there's a lake mentioned. Uh, is this lake overground? Is it above ground? Is it underground? I of course, we don't know for sure, but it seems like it may be a, a subterranean lake. And that, again, takes us maybe to a cavern that's full of water. Uh, then it's addressing the Senui, which are the two. So two of something. These two uh, bring, or you two, bring it, bring the Maju. The Maju are now these bridge yokes. Okay, now that is what I was referring to before here in front of the, the valley temple, I think it is possible that this is a physical, uh, this is a basically a mention of something that's actually physically present, which are these bridge yokes right here in front of the valley temple. Is it possible that, Zok, that Unas, the spirit, wants to enter the underworld through this dock here um, and is asking for these bridge ports to be laid so that his ferry can land and he can basically enter the underworld. So this is possible. Um, this is one way you could interpret this because we are, after all, in Giza because Zokar and Rostau are mentioned. So, um, and in fact, it says uh, Maju, these, these bridge ports of the desert. So we are basically looking at the desert. And of course, that's what begins right after here, now this is the Giza Plateau, which is where the desert begins. So the text now continues, PT301. And now we are, uh, I'm just gonna give you a heads up. So now you are getting the feeling that you are inside of the cavern. So, um, and the reason is because there is a very archaic, sort of a very primordial sense from the text. So what Unas is going to count now, what he is going to encounter now are the primordial gods of creation uh, and he will encounter them as shadows. So the shadow idea is very important. This is a very ancient concept that the shadow was part of a person. And when a person dies, the shadow is basically uh, escapes to the underworld and um, the family members of the deceased could ask a shaman to bring the shadow back. So the shaman would go into a trance. He would uh, try to catch the shadow, bring it back, imbue the shadow into a statuette and then put that statuette into a chapel so that the family could be with that person in, in a sort of real sense. Um, and that is called the statuette, the statuette ritual, the statuette making ritual. And Wolfgang Helk uh, proposed that this may be embedded inside of the mouth opening ritual that's written in the sarcophagus chamber. And Robert Schock and I expanded on that in our inventory stellar paper. And we actually pointed out the individual parts of the text where this entire ritual is being called upon. And so, so that's why shadows is an important concept. But now we add to that the idea of being inside of a cavern, a cave, where of course you have shadows um, when the light hits something, you don't see uh, the entities themselves, you only see their shadows. So, and it turns out that these gods are actually invisible. So let's see what Unas is doing now. So he's talking, he's basically offering them, which is called pat. So patek means offering to you. It's an interesting word choice because the pautiu are the primordial gods. They are the first gods that came from the distant island that came to uh, 
to Egypt to, to basically create the world and the universe. And so this patek is a, is a, literally means a bread loaf, but it's a, it's a rising bread loaf, just like the gods arose from the sea to create the world. So it's a beautiful way of referring to this offering and at the same time uh, making a bridge to these deities. So who are these gods? So, well, it says patek, so an offering of bread to you, enek to you, nayu hena enenet. So that's basically sky and under sky, so nu and nut. Um, and they are joined together, meshenmeti, which is the way this word is um, the way the word is spelled is using the, the same symbol that Kanum is spelled with. And Kanum is, of course, the, the god that creates the Nile, that opens the caverns. And there were two caverns, and he joins them so that the Nile flows. And so this is, this is uh, a, a, a nice way to bridge over to that. So this has to do with two gods, a couple of gods that are joined together. It's a, so it's basically primordial gods, the sky and the undersky. Nayu and Nanette, and they're joined together. Meshermenti uh, Netru are joint gods that are joined together. So then the text goes on and says, Senmeti Netru M Shusen. So now what Unas is doing is joining, join, join these two gods uh, in, in their shadow form. M Shusen. Shu is shadow. So he's joining them, their shadow. He doesn't see them themselves because they're not physical. They're immaterial. They have only their shadows can be seen. So again, we are in a cave now and the shadows is what Unas is encountering of these primordial ancestral gods, the first gods of creation. Now the same formula continues. Patek is an offering again for you. And this time now it's Amun and Amunet. Again, these are the natural nature's invisibility powers because Amun is hidden, so is Amunet. And the same idea, M. Uh, Meshenmenti, so the joint gods. So invisibility, the male and the female are joined just like sky and under sky. Here's the, um, uh, Unas basically joining these gods as well. Um, and not the gods themselves, but their shadows, Shayusen. Then again, we have uh, Patek means another offering to you. And now it's Atum and Ruti. So the double line, um, Atum is the, of course, the, the evening sun, the creator God that's self-created and, uh, and then made the universe and the world. Um, and so, and Atum is here, show, is here together with Ruti, which are then introduced later in a moment as uh, Shu and Tefnat, the original couple, of, uh, which is air and moisture. Of course, that's also invisible. So again, we have a couple that is joined together. Ruti is basically like the conjoined line. Um, but there's something now that's really interesting here is because they are made, Iru, uh, the two gods are made, Jetsen, Jessen, which means that they are self-created, okay? That means that no one created them. They created themselves. And that's an interesting aspect of if you want to believe that the great sphinx existed before uh civilized egypt that there was a statue there that was there always to them uh so they didn't know who created the statue and that means the statue just came out of its own power and that's uh, one way you can interpret this that uh the fact that iru neterui jetson jessen means that uh, that the lion the double lion uh, if there, if this actually refers to a statue, that it was it was always there to the ancient Egyptians. Uh, Selim Hassan, for example, th felt that this here is the very early form of Horam Achet or Horachti, the two names of the Great Sphinx in the New Kingdom, and he felt like this is probably how these two names got started. Um, this is. Uh, an interesting contrapoint to Robert Temple. I'm going to talk about Robert Temple's idea that the Sphinx used to be a jackal in just a moment, because this is going to be mentioned in a few columns down. But uh, I just want to, you to know, remember this because that contrasts with what Temple is saying that the Sphinx may have been a jackal, because here clearly we're talking about Atum associated with lions and not with a jackal. But 
in a moment. So um, anyway, so this is the important concept that uh, the double line is self-created. And it is, uh, and who are who is the double line? Well, Shu Pu means it's Shu and Tefnut, okay? Uh, air and moisture. So again, we have the most primordial of deities that are residing in this cave and Unas is encountering them. And uh, these two, the double gods, Aireti Netru, they have made the gods, they have begotten the gods. Uteti means they have begotten them, the gods, Netru. Sementi Netru means they have founded the gods. So it's the ultimate foundation. It's the ultimate creation of the gods comes from this, these primordial uh, deities. So the sky, the undersky, invisibility, male and female, atum and uh, air and moisture, basically. And now what Unas is saying is, is basically the text is saying to Unas, tell them, okay, uh, Jeten and to their, uh, to your, tell your father. So these are basically Unas's parents, okay, uh, primordial gods, parents, and he's telling them that he has brought them offerings, redai and then paut means this is the same offerings we just mentioned, the bread loaves, and so therefore he has, and he has therefore appeased them, sehetep ten, he has appeased you, uh, uh, and, and so therefore he's saying they should not put up an obstacle, chaseb, to prevent Unas from crossing Jav uh, near the horizon, okay, which is the Achet over here, near the Achet. So Unas's goal is to pass this cave of the primordial creator gods by making offerings respectfully, and then he wants to be able to pass on to the next station uh, because ultimately he wants to leave the horizon and enter the sky. So this is the ultimate purpose, of course. But um, but the, the key concept here is that he went through a cavern. The cavern is in, in Rostau, near where Zokar is. And this cavern has something to do with primordial creation. Okay, so now the text goes on with... Uh, uh, so Unas is basically now justifying why is it that he should be allowed to pass. And he's saying, Ayu Rechsu, it means Unas knows him. And who's him? He knows his name as eternity. Ne Renef means eternity is his name, the Lord of the year. So it means that Unas understands the eternity, the cyclical eternity of time. And he knows the, the, the magic that has to do with being able to enter eternity of time. And so therefore he should be allowed to pass. Only these primordial gods know the secret. And so since Unas knows it now, he should be allowed to pass. He's one of them basically. Um, now he's saying uh, Ma, uh, M, M or Ha means the weapon. Uh, Awi means the, the arms or the arm, the arms of horse. So the, the arm of horse is like a weapon. Hair sehedu uh, above the starry sky. Okay. And it revives seon. It should, it may it, so it may it revive Ra, which is the sun every day. Sherunib. And so by that token, because it does that for the sun, it should also do so for Unis. Ayredev means build, build Unis up um, or design him uh, or, uh, or um, recreate him, so to speak, materially. Um, and I shouldn't say materially, I should say Red Red relates back to Khanum, right? Because Khanum is a creator god and uh, the potter that, and so this red idea building that it, it again, we, we are in a cave. So, so that is where creation occurs. So that is what Unas is asking. He has left the, the offerings and he knows the name of eternity. And so he should be built up Kedef, to also come back to life, say on um, like every day. So this is clearly uh, 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 what this is saying is that this is the daily cycle of the sun. So every day the sun comes back to life in the east and it goes through this cavern. It passes through 
um, this last station and then it comes back to the sky and Unas is basically uh, going to this place now of creation and wants to be recreated because that is what happens in this cavern. So this, the idea is basically that if you can go to the place where creation occurred, then you should be able to also be recreated, be resurrected. Uh, <clears throat> and so now it continues. Um, ein, now Horus, uh, uh, Unas is now making another offering because he's now passing this cavern and now he's talking to Horus, Horus of the East. And so what he's saying is, Uras has brought uh, uh, near you. What has he brought? And he's addressing who? He's addressing uh, Heru Shat. So this is now Horus of the Eastern Delta. This is what I meant uh, in the Northeast. Unas has brought, has come, has, has, Unas has come, I'm sorry, uh, near Heru of Shezemet, which is the desert past the Eastern Delta. Unas has come, Herek Heru Ayabet, the Eastern Horus. So it's the direction is unmistakable. We're talking about the East and Northeast now. So we're now in the summer solstice region, and Unas is addressing Horus. Um, the they're basically the the this the 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 power that brings the sun back into the sky. And it, he's saying that look. Mark means look, Ayanek, I have brought for you, or Unas has brought for you, I Iretek, your eye, your great Uret, Iretek means your great eye. So this is the eye of Horus of the East. Uh, from M Ruchetet. And Ruchetet is an interesting name. So this is now the the this is the confirmation that Unas has been in the cavern because this is the word, this is one of the words for cavern. But interestingly, that word is a contraction of two other words. Ru and chetet means actually fiery lion. So it's perfect. It's, we, we're, coming from the, we're coming from the Sphinx, from under the Sphinx, from a cavern. And uh, both these, this idea of a fiery lion and the cavern are captured by this word. And that's where Unas is coming from, bringing now the eye of Horus to Horus so that he can enter the sky later. And if there... And any doubt that we're talking about the statue is now further alleviated because here's Shezep. Now this Shezep is used as a verb. It's saying receive an act to you, it, the horse eye basically. But of course it's a wordplay because Shezepu is also statue. So we have Ru Chetet Shezep means the lion, the fury, the statue of the fury lion. Um, so this is beautifully done. It's not the statue is not mentioned directly. It's basically circumscribed with these word plays, with these insinuations. It's beautifully done. Um, and he, they could have, the, the composer could have used a different word for cavern. And in fact, there are different words for cavern used uh, in, on the same wall and above, but he chose this particular one because, uh, because it brings back the idea of a lion. Uh, and this is not the, the last mention of a lion. There's more to come. So. Now, uh, what uh, uh, Unas is saying now, um, basically saying, uh, receive this eye of horse uh, from, from the arm of Unas, okay? Uh, and be sound with it. What, and Wejati means be sound. Um, so it basically appeals to the healing power of the eye of horse. So it basically horse is injured um, and by receiving this eye, he heals. Uh, uh, moose means uh, it's water, the, the water of the eye of Horus. Uh, be, be in, IMS means be in the water of it and be sound, Wajet again. Uh, with Wajet, or Wajat rather, uh, Wajat by the way is, is not just sound, it also is the word actually for the eye of Horus. And um, so that's a nice, again, that's a nice, confirmation that the eye of Horus has a healing power with all these different properties, but it, it does various things uh, to Horus and the sun in order to come back to the sky. And so he, these are all listed now. So here, for example, now it says, Theruz I'm, I missed uh, Wejat. So Theruz means to be red, to be gored. So there is a uh, a context of blood, there's a context of ink, because this is an inkwell. 
So we, we're talking about the line. Now we're talking potentially we have ink, writing, and we have line and blood, right? So there's this interesting play, writing and blood. Lines are predators. They feed, they, they prey, they eat their prey. They, they, go, they get all bloodied up. But, but the lion was also, the lioness was also a guardian of the ancient archive in, in early Egypt and the writer guild. And so we have this nice little interplay between, uh, between these two contexts. Okay, so Therus, I messed what Wejad. So be sound with it in its gore, but it could see it could also mean be sound with it in its ink, okay, with its with its writing. The eye of Horus is basically ability to um, to record information. Then it's talking about Hetu I mess uh, Wejad. So Hetu means uh, means vapor. So the eye has a certain uh, vapor that emanates from it. And so be sound with that vapor. I, ayak means to mount it. Um, then it says, take it for you. I, uh, ithenek means take it to your, take it to you uh, in its, in your name as, uh, as a shawl. Ayak, ayak is a shawl. So this is a shawl of, of the God. So it's another insignia potentially to become godly, okay, to become like like the sun god that's rising into the sky. Uh, Ayak means rise up uh, 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 in it, of it, in your name as uh, in your name as the sun, as Ra. So uh, the, this eye of Horus is basically conferring all these attributes to the sun to be able to go into the sky. And Unas is handing this eye to Horus. And of course, the idea is who Unas himself wants to be like the sun and enter the sky. Um, then it goes on with the die and neck means uh, put, put uh, you, put it on you, put on you uh, with respect to Hatek means forehead. And now here is the half the front portion of the line. And before I go on, I just want to explain real quick. The front portion of the line is a very, very old symbol in hieroglyphic. Um, it first appears in the context of precious oil. So the, the most, the best fraction of the oil is the initial fraction when you press the fruit that comes out, that's called the Hatet fraction. And that was symbolized with the front portion of the line. And so Robert Schock and I, when we wrote our major Fisher paper, we asked why did these symbols arise? Why would you split uh, a respected animal into two, into two halves? And we concluded that this may have been inspired by a split sphinx statue, a, a lioness statue that existed before the Great Sphinx. It was cut by the major Fisher. And so the ancient Egyptians felt like this is sort of a, a divine symbol of being split like that. And so they called the front portion, the Hatet portion and the back portion, the pay portion. And both of these symbols became extremely important, both in the, the trade of royal goods. And then it later becomes also important when it, uh, with magic, for example, Heka magic is symbolized by the back portion of the line. So, um, so if we go on now, so it's talking about, in this case, Hatet means forehead. So it's basically saying, put the, Put the uh, eye of Horus on your forehead as what? As, um, as in M. Renes, in, in its identity as Hatet, which is precious oil. Okay. Um, then it goes on uh, the, the, the Ruruk. The Ruruk means be red. So again, feasting lines are bloodied up. Uh, the, the Great Sphinx. Was, is a red statue, the blocks were painted in red. So here again, we have an insinuation that we're talking about redness, okay? Theruk, so be red in it, in its identity as the red willow. Now the thread willow, why is the willow, what does it have to do with red? Well, it turns out that the African willow had red stems and it's possible that the stems were used to extract red color for ink, it's possible. Um, I looked up uh, where ink came from. It usually what came, was made from ochre, but, uh, but it's not known um, what ancient ink was made from. It's possible that, th that the willow was used not just for medicinal purposes, but also to make ink. And that might be why 
there's this connection here between the willow and uh, and redness, and the redness is is imparted onto Horus by wearing the eye of Horus, and of course the red sphinx is a statue that was once red, and you can still see traces of that today. Um, all right, and then it goes on with uh, Hen 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 Henek Hen Henek I M S M Neteru M Renes Pu and Thehenet. So this is now Fiance, and this has to do with glistening. So you put the Eye of Horus on, and you start glistening like Fiance. Um, and then it says Hekenek, Imes, M Renes Pu. Hekenek is now interesting. Uh, it is a it is an a wordplay on Heken. Uh, I'm sorry, here over here. Hek Heken is a crocodilian deity in the north that was the male counterpart to Heka, the, the snake of, uh, of magic, okay? So here's Heken, I miss, and then it says, and Hekenu, Renenutet. So uh, Renenutet is the snake goddess, the cobra goddess, as you can see here, that rears the royal child. Um, so it's sort of a maternal, a maternal spirit uh, uh, deity in the beginning, but it was later combined with uh, with the Uraeus to become the cobra on the forehead. Um, and so this again has to do with a symbol of magic. So once you have the cobra on your forehead, that means you are empowered to use magic. Um, uh, to, to use magic basically to make it to the underworld and to, to pass into the sky and become immortal. And then Meres to means that Renenutet Ren, uh, Ren uh, uh, loves you. Then now we come to the jackal portion of this. So it says, stand up um, the, the, the great reed float, the Sechen, and here's the, the reed float here is a, is a reference back to something that's written on the south wall where Unas is basically taking a reed float to join Ra and Horachti on the other side of the Milky Way from where he is. And that's what this is a reference back to. So now we have this reed float mentioned again, and it's a great reed float uh, as Upuaut. So now here's the, uh, basically the Pathfinder Jackal, Upuaut. And he's filled, meheti, mehetik em achik means he's filled with magic, filled with masterfulness. Here's a, here's a phonetic uh, insinuation of mehit uh, again. There's other places in the pyramid text, but here again, there's this, there's this relationship between being a master and, and mehit. And of course, in the early dynastic ceilings, you see that the, the masters were scribes. And they were in a facility that was guarded by the lioness Mehit. And um, so that same, in fact, there is a ceiling where you see the Ahu, the master, in association with Mehit. And so here we have exactly the same idea. Why is Mehit mentioned directly? Well, it's because there was no more Mehit in our model. There was a lioness statue of Mehit that was remodeled into the Great Sphinx. And then the cult was basically demolished. And it was not supposed to be mentioned again. But it still comes up in an indirect way. And so what that's telling me is that the composer wanted to preserve this concept of the original lioness that was involved with scribes and with archiving and, uh, and with masterfulness. And that is sort of what this phrase here um, captures. And then, uh, um, so um, this is now Upuaut, the, the pathfinder filled with magic coming out, coming forth, Pereti M. Ahed, coming out in the, in, in the horizon. So the idea is basically that uh, in open up now a path into the sky through the horizon, and you need a pathfinder for that. And that's where the jackal comes into play. Um, and then uh, gra uh, grab for yourself or take, take to yourself, Ithanek, and now here's the only mention of the southern white, the white crown, the Uret, in this case it's called, here's the white crown. So this seems to be associated with the Ka of Unas on the east wall, going towards where the sun rises. 
while the red crown, the Desheret, is associated with the north, and that may have to do with the immortal star zone. So I think maybe that's how you can conceptualize this idea of why the king wanted to head both east and north, because these are two different aspects of the king. One is the ka, one is the ba, the birds, ba, the soul, heads for the north, heads for the red crown, while the ka heads for the white crown in the eastern zone where the sun rises. So, so the eastern, the, the southern, the hejet goes with the, the sun and the planets on the ecliptic and the red crown, the desheret goes with the immortals, uh, the, the stars around the North Pole. In any ways, this is the model, the working model that I'm pursuing. So, um, and this crown is by the elders, by the great ones, the, um, the Aou are the great ones. Here's another word for the great ones, the Uru, uh, uh, the Oau. So these are the ancestors basically, and they are giving this crown to Unas. The Gentiu are the foremost of the Eastern desert, Tenu. So this is now the, the this is where this crown is coming from. Uh, it's from the elders that come from the, the, I'm sorry, not the Eastern, the Western, the Western desert past the Delta. And uh, that's where Sobek is, Sobek, the Lord of Bahu. Um, and then it says, uh, Nayek, as you, as you traverse the marshes, uh, Chenzek means also it's traversing, coursing, as you course uh, among your, uh, your mangroves, your, your tree, your, your, your forest, so to speak, um, uh, and as you as you smell, as you smell, as you perceive the ka of unas, ka, unas, um, it says, "Let the ka of unas be like yours, and let it, um, let it arise, aya, to you, uh, it, with your with your own coursing." So he's basically saying. Unas, what what is Unas wants is to for his car to to uh, to travel with the car of of Sobek um, with the car of the sun. And then finally, the the passage concludes with um, wap irek, so it means basically to to wash Unas and purify him sebak erek, uh, wash you and purify you Unas. Uh, in the in your lake, Shayek means your lake uh, of the jackal. Um, so this is the Pathfinder jackal again. And so again, we have this idea that there's a jackal here at the entry to the sky out of the Achet, which is what we are saying. It's Giza, it's Rostau, where Zokar is. There's a cavern. After this cavern, we get to this lake. Um, and in this lake is where you get purified to be able to go to the sky. The ka goes to the sky with the sun. And uh, this is what Robert Temple, is one reason why Robert Temple proposed that the Great Sphinx would have been a jackal before. There's another passage in the sarcophagus chamber um, that's even more compelling. Uh, so he made a fairly good case based on the pyramid text, but um, I, I just want to mention it because he did a great job. It's a good book. Um, I don't think he's correct, but uh, I just want to point out why he, he, it's not that he didn't have a good reason to say what he said. So there are certainly jackals mentioned here on the way out into the sky and we are coming, we are in association with the Sphinx, with the lion statue, and there's also a jackal here. And so, um, that is the last station before you go to the sky. And so then it says, uh, the sa the sabiuk neteru. So these are the falcons. Um, basically, they're getting purified in this lake. Uh, soul, soul to you, sharp to you. Now this is a segue to the northern wall where the text continues. And now that segue will talk about the soul, the ba soul. So we were talking about the ka here, and then the ba is what is ascended on the north wall. Um, and in fact, the North Wall, the text begin with uh, a description of a helical rising of Ceres. So I think what's going on is that this mention of Ba and sub, Subdue, Ceres basically, here 
is a segue over to the north wall from this eastern wall where the car rises into the ecliptic into the horizon where the sun rises so again i think this supports the idea that we have the separation between the car and the bar going to different parts of the sky and that might resolve this apparent conflict that egyptologists are confronted with because they couldn't explain why the pyramid texts seem to be sending unas both to the east and the north and this might explain it it might explain why because these are two different aspects of the spirit of Unas, his Ka and his Ba going to different parts of the sky. And then the, the text basically concludes here with a formulaic mentioned four times Zep4 of um, the two Malachite uh, falcons. And so the significance of that is that in pre-dynastic Egypt, there is actually an example of a, of a cemetery building that had a, a statue of, of a falcon that was green buried in one of the corners of the temp of this structure. And so this may have something to do again with the sky with uh, maybe the green tone of the sun as it rises um, on the summer solstice. So, you know, there could be reddish tone, orange tones, it just depends on the time of the day before sunrise, perhaps there was also a greenish tone. And so all of this is descriptive this is what I'm trying to emphasize is that these texts, even though they sound like stories, they sound like they have no connection to something real. I think it's just the opposite. I think they are very descriptive. They are not, they are not empty metaphors. I think they're very descriptive metaphors that describe what was seen in the sky. And it was just interpreted as something that's, that's divine, not, you know, a physical scientific description of, uh, of the way that we describe physical phenomena. So the ancient Egyptians described it in their colorful language, but it is nevertheless descriptive. Yeah, and so um, this is uh, the, the end of it. I just wanted to mention one more thing that has to do with the column numbers. So this text is divided into 36 columns here on the east wall. And uh, the interesting thing is that this passage begins in column number 26, where Zokar of Rostau is mentioned. Um, and, uh, and this is exactly behind, this wall is in front of the, the left alcove that, of the Serdap right here. So the wall that we're, that, we're, that we're reading, this wall here is in front of this particular, this particular alcove here. And so I think that's why, that's why the position of the text is just as important as what the text is actually saying. So I think you have to you have to know where you are when you read the text in order to fully understand the text, because the text relates to places that uh, that have relevance in terms of the topography of these walls and the cardinal directions of these walls, and then the locations that are mentioned on these walls take you to that place in a sort of simulated way, in a virtual way. Uh, at a distance. So, um, so that's why I think this is a textual simulation using topography to create a virtual environment uh, at a distant site. And that's it.